him. Give him a hand clap of praise. He is worthy. You know, he's the best thing I ever found, or I should I say the best thing he ever found with me. Amen. He's very good. Very good. You know, here recently, I don't know about up here, but I know I think I read about one circumstance in Blountville where there was a home invasion here not too long ago. An elderly woman was raped, her car was stolen. And there's a lot of home invasions goes on in Greenville a lot. Seems like everywhere you look there's trouble. There's somebody always seeking to steal what you possess or maybe something you might have in your home that they wanted. They're always looking for a way to get in and when they think that they're strong enough to get in your house and take it, they'll come in and take it, David. They will. But you know, the Bible says a strong man guards his house. And uh, we need to look at that. But more important than our homes, there's an enemy that's wanting to have a home invasion of our heart, Teresa. Amen. There's an enemy out there that's seeking to take everything that you have, everything that you would ever have, Mark, and and make it his. He wants to get everything that you've got. And, and he's not just happy to, to steal from you. He wants to hurt you. He wants to harm you any way he can. He wants to get a whip out. And he wants to beat you with agony, a whip of agony, a, a whip of pain, a whip of despair, of discouragement. He wants to destroy you. He seeks. Any way that he can get in, any opening that he can get into your life. Amen. He's not content to let you go through the motions. He's not content to let you come in and sit in a pew in the church or in a chair. He wants to hinder you. He wants to destroy and hurt you. In the 11th chapter of the book of Mark, verse 21 through 23, when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his possessions are secure. But as soon as a stronger one attacks and overpowers him, the stronger one takes away the armor he had trusted and divides the stolen goods. Whoever isn't with me is against me, and whoever doesn't gather with me scatters. Okay, right. Now, Satan is a thief. He seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his main purposes in life. But now he's not content, David, to just get you. He wants your offspring. He wants everything that you possess. And, and somehow, sometimes, he has a desire to separate you from God. Any way that he can get your mind off of God, he wants you to come up to the fence I'll tell a little story here that I'm going to go on with that. Yeah, I saw him a while ago. Sometimes what you're really looking for is not what you really need. I know about when I wrote that song, I got a little bit of ridicule from one of our players at one time. It's no longer with us. But I was out on my deck and I seen this cow, and it was breaking its neck to try to get across the fence to get over to that greener grass. You know, even when to get to that greener grass because he thought it was better than the grass he was eating. Sometimes what you're looking for ain't really what you need, okay? And the devil seeks to get you dissatisfied with where you're at. He wants to make you unhappy going to church, and he wants you to, to look over here and say, what you're missing, this greener grass over here. He wants to lead you to this pastor where the grass looks so green. And not look at what you have here. And sometimes, when we go up to this fence that's separating us, God's got a boundary there we don't need to cross. And we decide, mm, I'm going over anyway. God said, don't go. But we decide, I am going to go anyway because I'm so strong will, Ray, I, I want to have it my way or die. So we crawl through the fence because we can't get enough strength sometimes to get over it. And we're over there where the green grass is at now, where we think green grass. And we're walking along and, wow, we fall in a pit. And, and, and we're in a hole and something's grabbed a hold of us and 
It's sucking all the joy take, that we ever had in our life. Because we know we're out of God's will when we're over here in this pit. We know we're not where God wants us to be because we've done left what we needed to be with Him and we went over here and He's got a hold of us, Teresa, and He's getting every bit of joy you ever had. And if you manage to escape from that pit that robs you of your joy and you begin to walk on and you fall into a cesspool. Everybody here know what a cesspool is? Yeah. You fall into that filth, the waste, the trash, every nasty thing you can imagine. And when we fall into this, this pit, this cesspool, we were, first thing we lose is our own respect for ourselves. Amen. That's the first thing we lose. When we the not where got a whole back like we thought was good and it ain't too good. We lose our self-respect. We lose the respect that others have for us, our reputation. That's the next thing we lose. But what's so sad, sometimes when we get out of that cesspool, we think, well, that wasn't bad. And, and, and we go feel covered and we stink. And we go through life, well, that ain't bad. And, and we go up to people and say, yeah, gosh. What is wrong with you? And, and we can't even see it. We can look in a mirror and not see, David, where we've gotten to, the place that we've fallen to. Because that grass looks so green and, oh, it looked good. It looked wonderful. But when we got over there where it was at, oh, we found some problems. The devil's loose some hornets. And they're stealing all your love. Oh, you peace. They're stinging you. They're hurting you. The devil don't like you. He hates you. And when you're over here where he sent you to do, he, won't, he sent you there for one reason, to torment you. And then you're walking along and all of a sudden somebody steps out. He's got you ambushed and he's got a fiery dart. And man, he said, oh, I got Mark lined up in my sights. And Mark said, I'm going to get my shield of faith up. But you left your shield of faith back there at the fence. So you're pierced with that fiery dart that the devil sent. And, and we look all around if we even escape that. Man, there's smiling faces over there in that green grass right now. I promise you they're there. Oh, they're smiling. They're happy. And they want to embrace you and hold you and stick that knife in your back. That's the way the devil works when you're over there. You need to remember what he's about. You need to Know that he's not come to do you any good. He's come to do you bad and hurt. He's like a roaring lion. That's fine, Ray. He's, he's like a roaring lion. He's seeking to destroy everything you are. You're done, Ray. He wants to kill your offspring and everything. Go on to the next one, Ray. <coughs> now, this is talking about who is the devil. Who he is? The first thing is, he is the accuser of the brethren. Now, what that means is he has access to God's kingdom. And the first time Teresa messes up, the devil's right in God's face. She says you're your show, you're, she's your child. Look what she done. But what he don't know, you done repented. And you, Jesus says it's under the blood. It's under the blood. But he wants to accuse us. He's the angel of light. He's that thing that looks right, David. Whether it be some strange doctrine or, or some strange belief. He makes it look right. He makes it look like this is the way it really is. But remember, he's an angel of light and he's set to deceive you. He's a deceiver. That's his purpose. He wants to deceive you, trick you, hurt you, and harm you. He's the prince of darkness. He's the tempter. Now what we must do, don't let your guard down. Now this is a martial arts school. And if David was to come up here and I try to hit him, he'd have his guard up. He'd know he's going to knock that down. You deflect that blow. We need to have our guard up when the devil comes, don't we? Because if we don't, man, he's going to wear us out, ain't he right? He's going to wear us out. Amen. 
Do not slip one step. Go ahead, Ray. Don't look at temptation one time. Do you know and realize we're all tempted, Mark? We're all tempted. Everybody in this building, I don't care, super Christian to new Christian, we're going to be tempted, right? Now I want you to think what would have happened if Samson hadn't looked upon the light. Now, Samson was destined to be one of the greatest judges that there ever was. He single-handedly killed over a thousand Philistines. Man, he had it going on, didn't he? Amen. But because he looked upon Delilah, something he did not need to be looking upon, he gets his hair cut, gets his eyes poked out, and he's down there grinding corn, pushing the thing around, grinding corn, and they're laughing and mocking him every day, laughing and mocking, and he keeps grinding corn. What would have it been if he had never looked upon that woman, if he had run from that temptation? Think to the great success that he could have really accomplished. Now we look at King David. Now King David in the Bible is listed as a great king. But there's one big blemish in his life. And when he was on the rooftop, and he looked down and he saw Bathsheba, he had run back into the palace, crawled up under the bed. He'd been a whole lot better off, wouldn't he? <laughs> you need to run from temptation. Yeah. Don't be sitting there, I'm being tempted. Oh, I like that. Get away from it. If it's a temptation to you, Better overcome it right real fast. Watch what you touch. We like to pet our sins. No matter what it might be. If it's a big sin or a little sin, we need to pet it. We want to rub it. Back. Oh, it's my pet sin. I don't care what it is, it's your pet sin. But what you really run into, stop near me. Now, I'm going to be dot seeing, and she don't know what we're doing, so be careful. If you're going to reach out here, I'm not going to hurt you. <laughs> now, I'm your pet seeing, and you're going to reach out, and you're going to pet me a little bit. Uh, you're not so bad. Yeah. You're not so bad. Yeah, I got you. Now, I ain't going to let you go. And that's what the devil does with your pet sin thing. That pet sin will grab you, and you can't escape it. Because we decide we want to pet it. It's not a pet, it's an enemy. You need to remember that. Amen. Right. Don't taste a single bit of dishonesty. And you know, I think, I think we all are faced with this. I remember uh, I was building a deck. And uh, it took a lot of big old long bolts about yay long to hold timbers together. And we had a hardware store down here at Kingsport at the time. It's called Munford's. And I was in there buying bolts. And they were quite expensive, David. And I had a supervisor that I worked with down at the plant come up to me. And he said, why are you buying them bolts? We got a whole storeroom down there full of them. I said, I'll write you a price for them. That's a temptation. That's a lot of money. I said, uh, I don't think so, bud. He got that mad at me over that because I wouldn't take the bolts. But you know, I'd rather have him mad at me than God mad at me. Because if you get God mad at you, you're in trouble. That's right. So if it's, if it's a temptation to you, get away from me. Now I want you to really pay attention to what I'm going to say here. Do not listen to even one little word of gossip. Do you know what a gossip's doing? I want you to grasp this. I want you to understand this. A gossip is a murderer. They murder somebody's character. If I'm talking about my brother back here, I said, oh, he's got that blue-gray shirt on. He knows if ever wear that. It's something simple like that. I am causing 
somebody to look at you in the wrong way. Or I've gossiped about you and said, well, he's this or he's that or he ain't this or he ain't that. And then I come to Teresa, you know, about my brother back here. And then you sit there and you got a choice. You tell me, shut up. Are you going to agree with me? The best thing you do is tell me to shut up. But we find that hard to do, don't we, David? Let's not be gossiping about anybody. That will destroy relationships. It destroys churches. destroys families. We must stop that. Do not think of a single, single thought of evil we need to learn to resist. Do not give way to any desire of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, or pride of life. Okay? On top of what the devil uses to break down your defense here. The first thing he uses is deception. See, he's been around a long time. Yeah, and he knows how to use it. Now, Adam and Eve were perfect beings. Or as close to perfect as you could be. They lived in a, a garden that there was no sin. And, man, things was good. But the devil come. And he deceived them by saying this. God does not want you to eat the fruit of that tree down there in the middle of the garden. Because you don't know as much as he knows. You ain't going to die if you eat of that. He deceived them. And they died. It took time, but they died. He sometimes uses a diversion. Sometimes he'll cause you to do a good thing. A good thing. And there's a lot of good things out there to keep you from doing the right thing. Am I making myself plain? Absolutely. All right. He'll call you to do something that there's nothing wrong with to keep you from doing what you're supposed to be doing. Okay, now, when Abraham and Lot came out, and they're coming close to the land of Canaan, the herdsmen began to fight because there was not enough land to graze both groups of sheep. Abraham, being the godly man that he was, told Lot, his nephew, if you go this way, you choose, I'll go that way, and our flocks will be separated. Now, if Lot had done the right thing, he would have picked that rocky path to go on. But he didn't. He looked down and seen Sodom. Seen the bright lights, David. I think I'll go down to Sodom. So he takes his family and he moves them down there. And the Bible says that he is in the gates of the city with his spirit being vexed because of the evilness in that place. He's being diverted from his purpose. He, he did not walk the way he should have walked. The Lord destroyed the city. Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt. His daughters got him drunk. Mess. Just a mess. And sometimes the devil uses doubt. And you think, you know, I never doubt. Well, now, the Bible says that John the Baptist was the greatest man born and woman. He was near as best as you could get. But when he was laying there in that prison, waiting to be beheaded, now, he had already baptized Jesus. He had already saw the dove come down. He already heard the voice of God that this is my beloved son. But he's in prison. He's in a place of despair. And he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you really the one? See, we're not above doubt, David. We think we are. We think we got it together, but we don't really have it together. He uses doubt. He uses discouragement. He, he uses delay. If you move right, go ahead. We're going to wind this thing down. You need to guard yourself. First 
thing is, we need to have that helmet of salvation on that we can guard our mind. The devil's going to bombard your mind. If he can't get you while you're awake, he'll get you while you're asleep, send you bad dreams. He'll do anything in his power. So he wants to get it beyond your mind and get it down in your heart where you accept it and you believe a lie. We need to guard our heart. We need to have on that breastplate. We as Christians need to get a hold of this right here. My mother really needs to get a hold of this. We need to guard our attitude. And I, I've seen a lot of uh, people, it's going to be the worst winter there ever was. Oh, it's going to snow 12 foot deep. We ain't going to be able to get to the grocery store. I ain't going to be able to get to my Big Mac down to McDonald's. I ain't going to be able to get out. There's wolves out there. Oh, my God. That don't sound like you got much faith in much trust. <laughs> when we're always looking, my mother, oh God love her heart, she's always looking. I think I got cancer. <laughs> she just had every test run on her. She can run on her. I've had them tell me. I've had doctors tell me, you got cancer? I said, I ain't got it. Still ain't got it, Teresa. Because of God. I'm not falling into that negative attitude. We as Christians get so negative. Church ain't going to ever grow. Somebody's always going to be mad. We need to tweak that thing up to its positive. But it's going to be a great day. Weather's well, going to be beautiful. Everything's going to be good. We need to be positive in our attitude. You past. The devil will always always cause you to look at your past. Because we've all failed. We've all come short. And the devil don't want to ever stop you from looking at that. A few years back, I had a harry, I guess, I mean it was hair raising experience. Ray, have you ever since you preach quite a bit, have you ever had one of them that you're not to preach and the pulpit's yours? Mm -hmm. and, and man, you, you're sitting there and you're like, I'm going to crawl under a pew. I don't want to preach. I mean, the devil is bombarding you with junk and you feel, I ain't worthy to get in that pulpit. Well, I was having one of them days. Pastor was gone. I had to preach. There wasn't nobody else to preach today. I didn't want to preach. I would crawl under a pew and die. Six o'clock. We told this tale before. I'm going towards the pulpit. I'm reading every minute of it. Six o'clock, the devil himself walks through the door. Short shorts on the Budweiser. That's all he's got. And I think, well, maybe he'll sit down back there. I'm hoping. <laughs> maybe he'll just sit down and pace out. But no. No, he ain't going to the back pew. No, he's coming towards me. I said, get this idiot out of here. He comes up to me. Looks me right in the eye. I said, I've heard a lot about you. Are you ready to take me on? I said, yeah. <laughs> because he that's in me is greater than he that's in the world of you. Well, this went on and this went on. And for three hours, we fought, we wrestled, we done everything you could do. And the whole time, this devil was telling me, hey, how are you talking to me? Do you remember back in... In 1962, when you done that, I said, under the blood. He said, do you remember in 1967 when you thought about this? I said, it's under the blood. Do you remember when you done this? It's under the blood, devil. Amen. And you know what? That boy finally got delivered. 
But don't you think that the devil won't always bring your tithes to you? He always will. And we need to really guard your future. I believe the Bible, I believe the Lord gives everybody in this place, everybody that's born again a vision. You have a purpose. We need to guard that vision. What is your purpose in life? Where are you going? What direction are you doing? What are you wanting to accomplish with your life? Surely it's more than sitting up here. Surely it's more than dragging out of the bed and getting through that service that preacher shuts up. It's more to it than that. We need to have a vision, a purpose in life. What are we doing with our life? What are we doing? Guess how I would. It's y'all's day for new songs. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the whole band. Hi. Just let her go, Ty. I like to say that. And I 
it seems like you just lost direction. Maybe it seems like you are 10 feet under the water and still sucking in air. You're just sucking in water and it seems you're upside down and you can't get up. But you know, if we just look to the face of Jesus, if we just trust Him, man, everything's going to be all right. If we could just break through this, this veil that separates us. If we could just break through this thing that's hindering us to having that right relationship with God. If we could just get the chain off, man, everything would be okay. If we could just have God supernaturally reach down and, and snap that chain in two, man, everything would be all right. Maybe like you got the weight of the world around you this morning dragging you down. You can't attain any goal in life that you want to attain. You know God gave you the vision of what you're supposed to be doing, but you're still, and you're still.